Welcome back. Now, Ubuntu 19.10 has been out for eh, not quite two months, about a month and a half at this point. And uh, like I promised, I did a part one review uh, where I covered most of the new features and, and sort of first impressions and reactions to uh, the project and where it's at at the moment. And, uh, and so today's video is gonna be about me uh, talking about some of the uh, thoughts that I've had since in the last month or so playing around with Ubuntu 19.10, uh, the default EO and Ermin uh, setup. And, uh, and I'm also going to kind of frame this in a way that we can talk about uh, what is really important for Canonical and the Ubuntu team to nail for the Ubuntu 20.04 long-term support release that will come out in April. This is gonna be an interesting one. I've been wanting to make this video for a while. I've got thoughts. And so uh, we're just gonna jump straight into it. Let's do this. Okay, so we're gonna try out a slightly different format with this video because of the fact I've just got so many thoughts to get through and so little time. And what I know about myself and how I work is that I think and talk a lot better when I'm not having to think about what I need to display on the screen at the same time. So I'm recording this as a voiceover and I'm just giving you guys stuff to look at while I natter on. So buckle up, let's do this. First of all, what I would love to see uh, and what I miss in uh, in Ubuntu 19.10, therefore would love to see in Ubuntu 20.4, 20.04 in April is, uh, is Wayland support, improved Wayland support. Now we can go back and forth about uh, the, the value of Wayland versus the tried and true xorg. The reality is, is that x.org is so old and crusty at this point that I just feel like the sheer performance gains that Intel and AMD users would get from having Wayland support out of the box. You're gonna have better high pixel density display support, much better fluidity with animations. The performance difference between uh, Fedora out of the box and Ubuntu 19.10, even though they're running the same version of the GNOME desktop is night and day in my opinion. And this all boils down to a more recent, modern, and a more efficient display server. Now I understand the big hurdles that Wayland has to get over when it comes to uh, Nvidia support. There are still some significant gaps there, which is, I mean, it's probably not gonna happen, but I love the approach that Pop! OS take in separating those two releases out. Intel and AMD users can go and download one edition and Nvidia users can go and download another. Now this ties in with uh, the fact that I really appreciate, you know, months forward, the fact that Ubuntu 19.10 actually shipped NVIDIA ISO, uh, NVIDIA drivers on the ISO, which meant that um, you no longer had to go and download a package in order to have your graphics drivers work out of the, out of the box. This is a huge step. Um, but being able to separate those things out and you know potentially give Wayland as the default display server to Intel and AMD users and then give Xorg as the default display server for NVIDIA um, users, I don't know, it, it, there might be significant technical hurdles here that stop this from being a reality. But, uh, but just in my limited experience and testing with different distributions that use Wayland versus Ubuntu, there's just something about the Wayland display server that seems wildly more efficient. Okay, it would be great to see uh, switchable graphics being fully supported and fully implemented. What I mean by this is that if you have a, 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 a hybrid graphics card, either Nvidia or AMD, and you wanna be able to switch those on the fly, the most recent NVIDIA drivers for Linux do support some form of on-demand graphics switching, which I think is amazing. Being able to fully implement that and support that in Ubuntu 20.04 would be incredible. Uh, and also I wanna point out that the Ubuntu Mate spin of 19.10 has a handy dandy little NVIDIA indicator uh, that sits up in the tool panel and allows for really seamless switching uh, with just logging in and logging out if you are wanting to completely switch which graphics card you're using out of the box. So I would love to see an NVIDIA or, or a switchable graphics tool that lives up in the indicator panel, makes it really obvious, really clear which graphics card you're running and, uh, and which one you wanna jump between. And given the um, a tremendous support that NVIDIA uh, are bringing to the table now more consistently, I would love to see this become a reality in the next release of Ubuntu. Okay, let's talk about packaging. Packaging is uh, was definitely a controversial issue for, for Ubuntu 19.10. I wanna break it down into kind of three main categories. First, I wanna talk about snaps, then I'm gonna talk about flat packs, and then I wanna talk about 32-bit support. Okay, so when it comes to snap packages, 
uh, there was there is obviously a momentum behind the snap uh, the snap packages and snapcraft as a as a platform to package and distribute applications i don't see that changing anytime soon but i do think some core issues uh, do do need to continually be addressed as we move forward towards ubuntu 20.04 uh, first of all, the performance side of things on Snap is is wildly better than what it was when Snaps first became a thing. Uh, and even the difference between launching a flat pack version of Spotify and the Snap version of Spotify is somewhat marginal. On first launch, the Snap version of Spotify will be a tad slower. Not crazy slow, just a tad slower. Uh, and definitely the uh, subsequent launches after that, both Flatpak and Synap are about on par. That is to say that neither of them are as quick as a natively uh, installed .deb, but the, the difference is so negligible that I don't think most users will mind if it means that they get an up-to-date version of their favorite application uh, that's maintained in the background and has the ability to download Delta updates and all that good stuff. What I will say though, is that when it comes to Flatpak support out of the box, while Ubuntu obviously does support Flatpaks, you do actually need to enable it and, uh, and uh, install the repository or Flathub to be able to access a lot of the free and open source software that Flatpak has to offer as a distribution system. Uh, now, here's where things get a little bit interesting. Obviously for Ubuntu, they are going to feel invested in Snap and promoting Snaps as the, the go-to place to find containerized applications that'll keep themselves updated and all of that fun stuff. So it would be kind of counterintuitive and a little bit anti-competitive, no wait, competitive for them to, uh, to both enable Snap and Flatpak via Flathub out of the box. However, I do feel like having a having a show of good sportsmanship, like having a, a welcome screen that asks users whether or not they want to enable Flatpak or Flathub as a repository or something to that nature might be nice as well. Of course, enabling these things doesn't take very long for those of us who know how to do it. So I don't see it as necessarily a priority, but it definitely does speak to the volume that uh, that Ubuntu prioritizes snap packages will continue to do so and uh, and some little bits need to be addressed uh, before the 20.04 release. Uh, now, so we've covered performance. We don't really need to talk about that a whole lot more, but we do need to talk about theming. Theming is still a little bit hit or miss. And I do think it is up to Ubuntu as the flagship desktop for the snap package to be able to really nail the theming side of things. Um, now, Again, not being a programmer myself, I don't know whose primary responsibility it falls on, whether it's the developer or packager of that particular Snap application, or whether it is the Ubuntu desktop to appropriately address the different themes that are installed on the desktop. But at the very least, every single Snap package that is, uh, I feel that has um, an installer base of a certain amount and higher needs to be tested uh, with the latest iteration of Ubuntu's default Yaru theme and, uh, and to make sure that things are up to snuff. Even things like uh, the difference in cursor, when you get a, when you get a basic kind of X, x.org cursor on top of your a pretty Ubuntu desktop that has a nice, really nice cursor theme, it is a jarring difference. So theming support does keep getting better release by release, but it's going to have to be something that looks very consistent. Otherwise, it is going to throw people off a little bit in terms of what the heck is going on with their desktop when certain applications run. And, uh, and I guess the same holds true then if they're going to talk about user installed themes. I don't know how this is going to be addressed in the long run. I think Flatpak seem to have figured it out for the most part. At least I find it a lot easier to theme my Flatpak apps compared to Snap Packages. Um, but again, it'd just be great to see something like a consistent uh, compatibility with at least the, the default Ubuntu theme across all of the Snap packages. That would be amazing. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the other things that I, I think really need to uh, happen in order for Ubuntu 20.04 to be able to take up the maximum amount of, uh, of use cases that will be left over from Windows 7 going end of life in January. Uh, because let's be real, a lot of the uh, traction that Ubuntu potentially could gain is going to come from uh, from those users, potentially. Um, so let's talk about 32-bit support. This is the this is the third piece of the uh, software packaging idea that um, that we need to unpack here. 32-bit libraries caused an awful lot of confusion in this release cycle, and honestly, this comes down to a particular theme that I'm going to come back to uh, in just a moment, and this is about communication. 
uh, when it comes to making sweeping changes or even introducing gradual changes into a project that is uh, that is beloved and used by literally millions of people uh, you do need to be able to communicate really effectively now Although their project might not be on the same scale as something like Ubuntu, uh, the elementary team do a fantastic job of communicating the why and the how of all of the changes that they make and introduce into their system. Uh, and at the very least, haters are still going to hate, but at least you have had the opportunity to fully articulate the reasons why a decision was made. And I feel like this would have benefited the Ubuntu release team an awful lot if they managed to do this in a timely and effective way with 32-bit libraries. Because even when this release came out, despite Ubuntu and Canonical making an official statement about 32-bit library support, that was a backtrack off uh, the community's original reactions. The reality is, is that the damage was kind of already already done at that point. And they didn't have, it was kind of too little too late when it came to people actually being aware of what the what the story was. The amount of comments that I have in my, uh, in my community post on YouTube saying, what should I look into for Ubuntu 19.10? The amount of comments that were questioning, oh, what's the go with 32-bit support? I heard Ubuntu's dropping it all and, uh, you know, my computer's going to die and all this kind of stuff. Uh, was I mean it's honestly it's the the picture is a lot better than that so when it comes to what they actually have done and what they will do moving forward is uh, it boils down to this that Ubuntu have claimed that they will work with Wine, Ubuntu Studio and gaming communities to use container technology to address ultimate end-of-life 32-bit libraries and they will also uh, consult with them and Valve and other um, and other, you know, very uh, deemed, quote unquote, very important 32-bit uh, libraries and applications to try and keep them supported uh, in this release, Ubuntu 19.10, and also moving forward into the Ubuntu 20.04 LTS release. Now, um, here's the thing. I think Ubuntu has the technology and the resources to be able to keep around whatever 32-bit libraries and applications they deem necessary. But in order to deem those necessary, they're really going to need to consult with the community through effective communication channels to figure out what exactly those are. And, uh, and that's no easy task and I don't, I don't envy uh, them being in that position. Uh, however, the fact that they uh, that they did listen to the the kickback that the Linux community gave them about dropping 32-bit library and application support, uh, that that is a good sign of things to come. Now, I do want to make it really clear that Ubuntu has not officially supported 32-bit hardware. Uh, for their desktop release in quite some time. It's been quite a few years now. But for those who have, uh, let's say, installed Ubuntu, I think it was 17.10 or something like that, on 32-bit hardware, they've been able to update their packages uh, and keep their distribution up to date up till this point. Now, from Ubuntu 19.10 and onwards, uh, those packages will be phased out and that the 32-bit hardware support is going to die altogether. Now, I think that's pretty fair because the people that are still using only 32-bit computers probably need to get a new computer. But 32-bit software and library support is another issue altogether, as uh, as a lot of different pieces of software, especially especially gaming-related and and creative production-related, uh, often rely on 32-bit plugins. And we've seen the fallout of this in macOS Catalina, where a lot of Adobe programs stop working because they're built on really antiquated libraries and plugins, etc. However, I do feel like there needs to be some more. Uh, communication given from Canonical and the team at Ubuntu uh, to be able to give a little bit more transparency to the process behind these decisions and avenues of feedback that they can give. Having said that, they do have their official Ubuntu 20.04 survey that is up and available and I'll tr try to remember to throw a link in the description below. Okay, the final thing I want to talk about is ZFS, uh, ZFS file system. It is a very chic, cool and uh, technologically amazing file system. No, you should not use it if you are an average desktop user that just wants to use Ubuntu on your laptop uh, just for basic everyday stuff. Honestly, unless you are an IT administrator, unless you're DevOps or somebody that will actually fully utilize the features um, and, and some of the intricate architectural uh, benefits that ZFS gives you as a file system, uh, honestly, it's not worth it. The performance gains that an average desktop user would notice are negligible at best. And I did try to do some tests between copying files between, uh, you know, copying files onto an, an ext4 partition versus a ZFS partition. And honestly, the difference was was pretty bland. Uh, now, 
What I will say is that if you were a technically inclined user using BTRFS as your primary uh, as your primary file system, and you liked it because of the rollback and uh, snapshot uh, capabilities, then definitely check out ZFS and see if you can wrap your head around it and utilize it. Because um, what my research and, and very very limited experience tells me is that it is a technologically superior file system and much better tested than uh, BTRFS. So definitely go and check that out. And, uh, and But to all of you regular desktop users, there's literally no point in, uh, in using ZFS at this point. Here's the last thing that I wanna add. I think instrumental to Mac OS's success when it came to gaining market share after it switched to Intel architecture was the ability to uh, successfully market distribute and give uh, Mac OS users a way to virtualize or to run Windows in some meaningful way to be able to cover the gap that uh, that Mac OS had in its application catalog. I believe that Ubuntu should uh, make a very, very easy way for end users to uh, to have Windows and Windows software running somewhere in and around their system. The, the potential for Ubuntu to become a, a more primary operating system because of the fact it's just superior in so many ways, uh, should, in my head anyway, give people the opportunity to run uh, the Windows software that they can't get away from uh, so that they can keep using their favorite operating system in a professional environment for the applications that they need. Now, I, I also think that Linux and the Linux kernel has more than enough technological capability to make this happen in, in an efficient way. Uh, and I'll be, I'll be uploading an interview that I did with Yuri Herrera of the Nitrix project and some of the interesting things that he and, he and the team are working on with vMetal, uh, which is basically an, a, a front end for QEMU and KVM uh, virtualization of basically hardware accelerated virtualization on, uh, on Linux. Is, uh, is very cool. And I would love to see a company like Canonical throw their effort in behind developing a really nice front end uh, to streamline the performance of, uh, of a Windows environment on their desktop. And if you think about the reverse, it's very, very easy to install any kind of, uh, of subsystem on Windows 10. You can just go into the Microsoft store and install Ubuntu, like it's that easy. So I would love to see it become that easy uh, imagine a world where you could just go snap install Windows, um, you know, Windows 10, and then all you need is the activation key for an ISO or something like that. That would be amazing and have near native performance. Uh, that would be a brave new world for the Ubuntu desktop. And I think it would help immensely. Uh, so those are my thoughts. That's kind of my part two wrap up of Ubuntu 19.10 slash what needs to happen before Ubuntu 20.04. Look, thank you so much for sticking with me this far. I had a lot of thoughts to get out. And uh, so we will continue with kind of regular programming in the regular format in the very near future. Um, but let me know down below, what do you think are the most important things that Ubuntu needs to work on before April of next year or in the next, uh, in the next two or three year release cycle? Let me know down below. Thank you so much for watching. Like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace out, ladies and gentlemen. 